Thank you to Professor Bovis and to the organisers for inviting me here this afternoon to talk about public procurement. I can talk for days about public procurement, but luckily for you, only 10 minutes uh, this afternoon. So I'll see what I can cram into the next 10 minutes. I'm going to... Three topics. Firstly, public procurement reform in the United Kingdom. What's going on? Uh, secondly, the reform of the directives, um, our position on it, what we like, what we don't like. And uh, lastly, what we're doing in the UK to support growth. Uh, I know lots of uh, companies here this afternoon support growth both to large and small companies alike. So uh, I'll start off with public procurement reform. I've been in government in public procurement for a long, long time. Never has it been so uh, such a high profile corner of the world uh, because uh, people realise just how important it is in this economic climate. So the scale of public procurement reform in the UK over the last two years and continuing over this parliament is, is unprecedented. The sorts of things that the current government have introduced include a, a complete freeze on quite a lot of forms of spending so uh, across central government. So putting in place very, very stringent controls that says you are no longer allowed to spend money on this unless you come to the centre and get approval. Uh, completely uh, changing around uh, the, uh, lots of common forms of procurement like professional services, like uh, uh, commodity IT. Also uh, centralising procurement. So for common goods and services, the presumption is it should be bought once by a central purchasing body and that all of the other central government authorities should uh, buy into those, to those contracts. We're not there yet, but there's a very strong push. No longer the argument that says, my pen is different, my ministers need different stationery, and therefore we are buying X. The answer is, there is a common standard for stationery, and you will buy it like this. So a, a big cultural change for some of our authorities in the UK. We've also... Uh, called in major suppliers to government to chat about how we can release more savings. And that first round of chats yielded 800 million in year one. Uh, the second round of chats is ongoing as we speak. The savings from the Efficiency and Reform Group, of which I am part in the Cabinet Office uh, in the year to uh, March 2012, released £5.5 billion pounds worth of additional savings, of which a very significant proportion were down to procurement savings. That's how important uh, procurement is, not just for releasing savings, but also for stimulating growth, and I'll come on to that. We also are looking at public service reform more generally and how services can be reconfigured to meet the demands that we face today. There is much less money, there is much greater demand. The two of those are incompatible unless you do something much more radical in terms of public service delivery. And that means doing things differently. It means encouraging more innovation. For us, it means looking at many, many more different types of model for public service delivery. Professor Bovis has already mentioned mutualisation, third sector providers. We need to get away from this, provide by the state, provide by the private sector. There are many, many more models we can release to deliver the kind of innovation in service delivery that we need. The public procurement directives, we absolutely fully support the Commission in bringing forward these changes. We absolutely agree with you that the time is now and we thank you for bringing, bringing forward the proposals and for the presidency for driving them forward at speed. And we completely support you with continuing to drive it at speed to get the changes that we need. We welcome many of the pro proposed, uh, many of the proposals uh, that have come forward. The things that we welcome, more freedom for procurers to negotiate, simplification, faster procurement, greater clarity on dynamic purchasing systems, innovation partnerships, assessment of, allowing assessment of past performance at selection stage, allowing skills and experience assessment at award stage, 
e-marketplaces, e-procurement, clarity on social and environmental aspects. There is much with which we can and do agree. We also welcome the direction of travel on the proposed oversight bodies. We think, I agree with my colleague from Volvo, is that this needs to be done in a very, very simple way. In the UK, we already have uh, mechanisms, bodies that oversee public procurement. We also have informal mechanisms whereby a supplier of any size, indeed anybody, can come to us in the Cabinet Office and say, that procurement doesn't appear to be following best practice. Not even that procurement doesn't appear to be within the rules. It just doesn't look, it doesn't look very sensible. And we will take up uh, that case on behalf of that supplier. There are three ask for, asks for us in the reform of the directives. Firstly, does it deliver faster, leaner procurement? Second, does it deliver clearer, more transparent procurement? And thirdly, and most importantly, will it cut costs and will it deliver better value? If any of the proposed amendments don't do any of those things, then we are likely not to support it. And I'm sure we get support from many member states in adhering to those goals. Of course, uh, this is a very complex dossier and there are areas with which we'd like to see further changes. And I'll outline those to you now. We remain concerned that uh, the removal of the distinction between Part A and Part B services will see many more procurements fall under uh, the regime. And uh, I go back to my objectives. Is it simpler? Is it clearer? Is it more transparent? We don't think we're there yet uh, on, on that element. Uh, we would really like to see uh, a temporary exempt exemption in the directives uh, for the new types of bodies that I was talking about earlier. If you've got an employee-led organization, social enterprise, how can we nurture that and let it grow before it's out there and having to compete uh, in, the, in the market? Um, we think this will be a stimulant to uh, new forms of enterprise uh, across Europe. We also believe in the benefits of open markets. And uh, as Pierre said, uh, there are many differing views on the uh, proposed instrument for reciprocity. Uh, we believe that it will lead to tit-for-tat uh, measures and actually risks, not just from a protectionist point of view, but from a value for money uh, point of view, has some risks. So, of course, we have, much more, uh, we have much more to do, but I think let's recognise just how far we've come in this very short time and thank the Commission and others for, for getting us there and give, give them our full support in, in moving swiftly on. Lastly, on growth. Uh, we, this government, again in the UK, has set for the first time an aspiration that 25% of its central government business uh, is awarded to uh, SMEs. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a target, it's not a discriminatory measure, it's an, it's an aspiration. And uh, m my team in the Cabinet Office are there to support government departments uh, in order to achieve this aspiration. Uh, one of the first things we need to do is actually be able to measure uh, systematically, regularly, how much business uh, is going to SMEs, but also not just directly in the supply chain. Uh, equally important. Uh, when we started 18 months ago, very few departments could actually measure on a monthly basis uh, how much business was going to SMEs. The majority of them now can, with the exception of Ministry of Defence. Uh, uh, the majority of the can now do that on a monthly basis. We have just written out to the 100 uh, largest suppliers to government uh, for the third time, saying, tell us how many SMEs are in your supply chain, and I'm pleased that we're now getting improving numbers of suppliers that can tell us that too. We have a, a programme uh, for getting to that aspiration that involves everything from removal of ridiculous barriers to SME entry to the procurement process, uh, pre-qualification questionnaires that are 100 pages long, for a £50,000 procurement, I kid you not. Um, we, and I could go on with stories like that. 
We have introduced, as I said earlier, this service called the Mystery Shopper Services, Mystery Shopper Service, where small firms can ring us and say, this is just bad practice, please do something about it. Whether it's an onerous financial requirement, whether it's, whether it's a requirement that hasn't been broken down into lots and could have been broken down into lots. Also, uh, we have a program of public procurement and growth. Uh, Professor Bovis himself helped us articulate the contents of that program by helping us look at the flexibility in the existing directive and making sure that we were making the most of that. That program, the, ver the fundamental element of that program is we, we should tell the industry about what it is we are intending to buy. So this is much more, this is, a, and we have committed to producing pipelines in every single major sector. So this is not about the OG process, the PIN process, this is about being able to have a strategic dialogue with suppliers about a pipeline. And it's about being honest with the industry and saying, look, we're not 100% confident that we'll buy that, but actually we're pretty confident and if it changes, we'll tell you, rather than we're not going to publish anything about what we're intending to buy because we might change our minds. So we have a very ambitious program of pipelines. We released 70 billion pounds worth of pipelines in April and we have another tranche uh, planned for the autumn. What's important then about that pipeline is a dialogue about that pipeline and about what it means and a dialogue in partners partnership with industry about that pipeline in terms of what it means for UK, for the UK. So this is not, by the way, about skewing procurement to favour uh, any particular firm or any particular size of firm. I think it's, it's best practice and it's best practice in the most forward thinking countries elsewhere in Europe. I hope those three things, the incredibly ambitious public procurement reform and indeed reform programme generally, our position on the directives and a little bit about growth has given you a flavour about uh, what's happening in the, in the UK and uh, I look forward to being challenged in the Q&A session. <laughs>